This is the Change Fell Podcast with Kevin Brennan and Julian Sammy. Episode 4, Wicked Problems on June 14th, 2016. Subscribe, listen, watch, and read at change.fail. That's not change.fail.com. That's just change.fail. Hello, Kevin. Hi, Julian. How are you today? Well, I feel wicked. <laughs> and how is that different from most days? Some days I feel wicked and something else. That's fair enough. I mentioned that I feel wicked because today's topic is wicked problems, of course. And Kevin's, Kevin wanted to start us off and uh, describe the difference between a wicked problem versus, say, just a complicated one. Sure. So, a wicked problem isn't a problem that's necessarily evil. A, a wicked problem is a term used to describe a problem that is not merely complex, but that is so complicated and emerges from you know, such confused and difficult to understand initial causes that you can't actually figure out what the root cause of the problem is. And therefore, you can't figure out a solution that is guaranteed to actually fix the problem. So if you try to solve a wicked problem, you may in fact end up making things worse. And, wicked problems... And, well, I was just going to say, not only are the, the problems hard to solve, they can be hard to describe in the first place. If you, like the act of trying to describe a wicked problem defines the problem you're trying to solve and the potential solutions in many ways. That's correct, but you may be defining it in a way that actually misses out on key points. Another thing about wicked problems is that part of what makes them truly wicked is that you may only get one shot at solving them, that the investment and effort required to attempt to solve a wicked problem is so large that you can't just, you know, try a bunch of things and see what works or give a tentative attempt to solve it. You actually have to commit yourself fully to a particular solution, even though you don't know that you're doing, giving the right solution or even solving the right problem. So all in all, they're a tangled mess. The idea actually came about originally in a, in a paper by a guy named Horst Rittel which I am sure that I'm mispronouncing, but uh, he s described wicked problems, I think it was back in 1973, in an article called Dilemmas in a General Theory of Planning. A lot of the acts associated with defining the problem um, also define the solution. Now, you know, as people who are deeply steeped in business analysis and design thinking, one of the key elements of both of those is that you try to isolate the problem from the solution and generalize the problem description so that you can uh, be free to explore solution options. And that's not always possible with wicked problems. Right. And in fact, that's what makes wicked problems different from the tip typical kind of problems that a business analyst faces, where you're trying to optimize a business process or develop requirements for a new software solution or figure out how to better or best organize a company. In all of those, you have, you, or you can typically get to a well-defined problem that has a limited set of reasonable solutions. And a wicked problem is a case where you can't do that. And in business context, I think you're more likely to find wicked problems emerge at the strategic level where a company is faced with a major choice because of changing the market and, you know, there is, is no easy right fix to that problem. In general, around the world, some examples of, of wicked problems that have failed or are currently failing might be things like the Middle East, where you have a tangled knot of all kinds of interacting situations and no matter what I thought when I was 20 and the world was simple, the reality is that that is a wicked problem. There's no one right way to do it. There are morally defensible and indefensible approaches um, to the problem on all sides. And no matter what position you take, 
there's just no simple way to go about making things better. And if anyone ever says, well, all you need to do is, then you know that, that they're not thinking about the problem in the right way. Actually, Julian, I think that while, the, while what you described is not one of the part of the formal definition of wicked problems, I think it's a good signal that you've come across one where you run into a situation where you can find multiple people with deeply held beliefs about what is the right thing to do, and each of them it appears completely correct from their point of view, yet they are 100% incompatible in terms of the outcomes they're producing. Yeah, that's a fascinating um, way of thinking about what we might be dealing with or when you might be, be dealing with a wicked problem. One of the challenges of wicked problems is that you often don't know it's a wicked problem until you've tried to solve it and discovered you've not only not solved the original problem, but created a host of other ones. Yeah. You know, that, that amount of rework or new work that gets spawned by these evil little monkeys is something that you want to try to avoid if you can. And in the business world, I think something that verges on being a wicked problem is the whole Uber and Lyft versus the taxi industry. So why would you say it's wicked? I mean, I see two sides there, but I don't necessarily see uh, the level of intractability in the Middle East or our reliance on fossil fuels. Those are even better examples, yes. But I think there are elements of wickedness to the Uber versus taxi story. So tell me about that. Like, I'm curious about why you think that. A lot of people come up and they say, well, obviously Uber's a good thing. It makes prices lower. It makes it cheaper, right? It's very convenient. Why wouldn't you want Uber? Well, here's the thing, though. The way Uber works is that it relies on, you know, pulling drivers from a pool who you know, do this as a part-time basis, which means that they aren't, they aren't insured necessarily. They don't have their cars maintained. And in fact, at the rates that Uber pays most of the time, they can't afford to go on and take on the additional burdens of commercial licensing Right. that the taxi companies take care of and do. The downside, of course, on the taxi side is that, you know, taxi medallions are incredibly expensive, incredibly valuable, and it gives them a virtual monopoly. So you have a very entrenched interest there. One of the things that made me think about this as an example is that both sides can make a strong economic and even moral argument as to why they are right and the other side is wrong. Not just competitively, but actually you're bad. You're doing something that is da damaging and dangerous and hurting the economy and hurting people. That makes sense to me. That, that makes it clearer why you, you would approach that in terms of a wicked problem. I was thinking about it more just in terms of how Uber is so good at externalizing costs to their drivers and, and risk to their drivers. But of course, externalized costs can be a key factor in a lot of wicked problems. You're right. Externalization of costs is actually one of cited in the literature is one of the key things that can start to make a problem wicked. The costs get offloaded and that gets into a tangled mess of what is be best and what is beneficial, you know, just as it does in the case of the environment. Because a lot of the costs of generating power and generating fuel and creating fuel are, you know, dumped out into the environment, they have an impact, and then when it comes time to clean up and fix them, well, who pays for that? And how do you justify saying one group or another? Because everybody involved benefited from the externalization of costs, or at least a great many people did, right? And that gets to the, the challenge of actually defining the problem. If you limit the, the problem definition to, you know, just the, the amount of money people get paid or the, the amount of uh, money that people earn, that's one thing. But when you start to factor in other aspects of that quote-unquote trade, then you're dealing with a more complex situation where there are gains and losses on all sides, potentially. And when you get into that kind of a mix, it gets much more difficult to disentangle any particular element and to find that key log, that, that one thing that you can change or use to, to, uh, as the, the fulcrum for a change. Similarly, if you're a taxi driver or a taxi company, what do you do about Uber? Well, the first response, of course, is to try to get city council to ban them. So that the pro because from your perspective, that makes the problem go away. 
Right. But if you can't make the problem go away, then what? I mean, what do you do with your company, with your sunk costs, with your structure to make it a viable alternative? This is a, a case where we're seeing a, a fundamentally new business model, a fundamental restructuring of a particular market, and you can't, no individual organization or, in fact, no industry can really stand against that. Um, at least not not forever and probably not for long. But the same thing happened with music. Um, the music industry has been working for hundreds of... Well, the music industry fought against player pianos. Yeah. They have a long history of trying to ban recording technologies and distribution technologies uh, as a strategic approach to managing their their revenue stream and their insistence on fighting against the the increasing ability to record and distribute the the product has led them to some very dark places but actually solving that you can't fix that with legislation there's no simplistic solution that's going to work no, and I think an actual even better example of a wicked problem is in a closely related industry, which is news. Yeah, absolutely. Because for a long time, um, socially, we've been dependent on the existence of relatively independent news organizations as a check on other powerful acts of society. And that hasn't always worked. They haven't always done, you know, what you might feel they need to do, right? Certainly there's quibbles you can have with that. But the principle, I think, has been relatively sound. The problem is that somebody has to pay for that journalistic work. People can't just go and spend, you know, six months investigating, I don't know, child abuse in the Catholic Church or Rob Ford is smoking or, or, or without having some sort of reliable source of income. And that means that news organization needs to fund itself. Traditionally, the way they've done that is that they had a chokehold on particular forms of advertising. And distribution associated with yeah. was the reason they had that chokehold. But with the introduction of the internet, we see two things that come together. One is a powerful force for democratizing news and discourse among people. And with all the good and bad that brings, and if you want to know about the bad, just go into the comment section of any major news site. Do not read. You read our comments. Read our comments at change.fail. Don't, don't read the other comments anywhere. No. There's also been the complete failure of the old advertising models for supporting news. They've disintegrated because they relied on having a huge slice of a relatively homogeneous market. And, I mean, it hasn't worked that way for quite a long time, at least since... Craigslist. I was thinking, I was trying to remember when um, The Long Tail was written. I'm not sure exactly, but I do know that if you go and you look at newspaper revenues, uh, basically they've been falling off a cliff since Craigslist. Let's look at some of the things that are, that are attacking it. We have, on the one hand, we have the disappearance of ad revenue, which is used to float it. Now we see, on the other hand, companies like Facebook taking control of the web and its in distribution of information. And one of the things that came up with Facebook is the big blow up a few weeks ago around Facebook and conservative news when one former Facebook staffer claimed that there was routine suppression of conservative oriented news on Facebook's trending topics. Now, I don't know that trending topics is something anybody relies on for news. And, you know, other staffers have denied that this is truly a factor. But whatever, whatever Facebook is or is not doing, there is no question that Facebook filters the information it provides to you based on your interests, who your friends are. And so if you live in a circle of people who are fairly like-minded to you, Facebook and other things are more and more get helping inadvertently ensure that you only see news that is palatable 
to your point. Yeah, they, they call it the echo chamber effect. Yeah. And while that is certainly the case, I've heard it argued fairly persuasively that it's very unlikely that Facebook is setting out to have a left-leaning bias. Um, it's more likely that their algorithms and the, the work that they do is uh, leaning away from hate speech, for example. I think that's absolutely co correct. I agree with that. I don't think the problem would be nearly as wicked if it was an institutional deliberate bias, because then you could say, bad, don't do that, and people could stop. But because it's algorithmically driven, because it's based on other things that are going on and other areas in the internet, what is the simple solution to having a well-informed electorate, which may include them learning about things that don't fit inside their worldview? How do you change Facebook to do that? Well, we have this interesting recursive uh, feedback loop where my biases affect my network of friends, which affect my biases, which affect my network of friends, and my beliefs, obviously, as well as my biases. And that's normal. That's human behavior. Uh, at the same time, Facebook allows that or facilitates that being amplified in a way that was not possible before the advent of, uh, you know, online news and uh, and social networks the way they exist today. So we've taken this, you know, thin slice of online communication, injected it into real-world relationships, and now we're starting to see these emergent effects that no one predicted. Uh, I think that's also something that you can expect. If you, if you have a wicked problem... There's probably effects that emerge from the system that you couldn't predict before the system was operating. We're talking about this in terms of a failure that Facebook is going to uh, cause at a, at a social and societal level. Is it a failure at a business level? No, and that's part of the problem. Um, in fact, Facebook ha is, from a business perspective, Facebook is completely incentivized to do what they are doing, i.e. to make you want to spend more time in Facebook. And making one thing that will probably not make you want to spend more time in Facebook is seeing all sorts of stuff that you don't want to engage with and you don't want to hear about uh, uh, that makes you angry, right? Wait, making people angry is a great way to get them engaged and spending more time to a point. To a point. But see the comment section on a newspaper. But with but Facebook is different, right? Yeah. A newspaper is, is something where I'm being told what some professional says I should believe or is real, as opposed to Facebook where people I know or, you know, have some personal relationship with at some level, are expressing their opinions and feelings. It's a social contract there. People get angry, uh, and when they disagree on those sorts of things, and then spend a lot of time, if not reading, writing their opinions. So on the one hand, I think Facebook might be incentivized to show you lots of, you know, cute cat pictures and funny, trivial things because those are popcorn. But also, if their algorithm only shows you that, then people will get bored and will leave. Yeah, and you can assume that Facebook is going to be incentivized to find the right mix of stuff that keeps you on the site, right? Which is not necessarily, and is, in fact, I'm fairly certain is not the mix of stuff that say an informed citizen ought to be aware of to expect facebook to do that is on some level unreasonable yeah the boundary of the problem that we're talking about here is not the boundary of facebook's corporate structure or even the boundary of uh, facebook and its users it's uh there's a relationship between facebook the and the population and what they do and how they do it, what we do and how we do it, 
from a, a political, from a social, from, from many different uh, dimensions. Google has the same issue. They can bias your search results. Uh, Amazon can predict election results based on buying patterns. At what point can these massive entities choose who gets elected? Right. And probably they could do a lot more, more than I have any reason to believe they actually do. Right. They Again, they have incentives to not explicitly get involved in doing that stuff. The biggest one being, of course, that you can bet you if it was ever shown that Facebook went set out to change, affect the results of a U.S. federal election, that would lead pretty quick to some sort of heavy-handed government regulation. But that government regulation would fail. So there's an example of uh, an approach which would be a single, simple intervention against a problem that does not respond well to that kind of intervention. Right, a wicked problem. So yes, the, it, the solution would probably be the wrong one, and it would have unintended and ongoing effects that would change the dynamic of the problem, right? And this is what makes it wicked. So this is like what uh, happened in Europe with Google, where the newspapers got all up in a frenzy and started doing things to limit Google's ability to distribute news uh, and to link to their content and so on. And it, uh, it was a matter of days after they got some legislation in place and, or regulation in place where they came back to Google and said, our, our revenues dropped 70%. Please, please link to us again. Please, pretty, pretty please. Right. And so, again, you had – it was like, yes, Google was creating a problem for them, but getting Google away made it even worse. And once again, here we come back into why this is a wicked problem. You can't point at Facebook and say, bad Facebook, right? You're, you are causing civil society to fracture and change. They are, but it's not something that they're trying to do. It's not, some, it's not a goal of Facebook to blow this stuff up. And most of the interventions you can try to think of would probably have all sorts of bad effects of their own. So we come back to this is genuinely a wicked problem. There are all sorts of forces causing us to move in this direction of having a increasing echo chamber on what we can find out and what we know, right? And there is no straightforward and obvious fix for it, and there's no straightforward and obvious right answer for turning it around. What, what are you going to do? Turn off the internet? Regulate what companies can publish on the internet? Those are also bad ideas. Well, Mr. Trump, you know, we should talk to those guys about turning that off. Okay, I'll yeah. cut that out. So, <laughs> so what I was going to say, when you're dealing with problems at this scale, frequently it seems... You're actually dealing with some core aspect of human nature. It's not that Facebook is making people worse or making uh, people live in echo chambers. We already do that. We already did that. Facebook is enabling people to do it better. And let's be clear, the vast majority of all technological development ever from fire to the wheel to facebook to i don't know hyperdrive one day all of those things are aimed at making humans better at doing something or making us able to do something we could never have done unaided so facebook is not causing this problem facebook is an example of the ongoing development and integration of technology into our lives. And that's never going to go away, at least not while we're human. Technology doesn't let us do things we want to do. Technology makes us better at being human. Anyone who's ever fallen off of a diet knows that being better at being human is not the same as being a better human. We've described a few ways that you can recognize wicked problems you know, from a practical point of view, for example, wicked problems have no definitive formulation. It's, you can argue about the nature of the problem endlessly. In fact, as we have been doing, you know, where does the boundary of the newspaper issue end? You know, we ended up with, well, because humans 
And that's a, a rather large change of scope for, for talking about why newspapers are struggling. So what, what can you do about it if you think you've run into a wicked problem? Like, what do you do if you're a news organization and you're faced with all this and you don't know what to do, right? Because there's nobody who can come and tell you, well, with Facebook doing what they're doing in publishing and with the way Google is working and with Craigslist and other things taking away your ad revenue, you know, you try things like, let's start up a paywall. Oh, that doesn't work. You lose readers. Well, let's put stuff on Facebook. Oh, we're losing readers. It seems like everything you can do could potentially make things worse. What kind of things can you do to get a grip on moving forward in an environment where you may be faced with a wicked problem? I think that the the first step after you think that you've you've got a wicked problem is to take a step back. And when I when you take a step back you can see a wider field of view. Wicked problems are often worse when you narrow down and try to isolate just one thing, one way to, uh, to try to deal with them. And look at other factors that come into play. One of the big things that you can see that these companies are trying to do is they're trying to protect their existing business model, right? The way they have made money in the past, the way they have stayed in business is this advertising driven thing. And the technology is evolving in a way that it, they are losing control of that advertising revenue at best and seeing it fall in many ways at worst. So instead of focusing on how do we defend our existing business model? Uh, you need to take a step further back and look at what is our purpose and what are we here to do? And if that is, well, we exist to you know, provide important news to our community, to our world, right? The question then becomes, okay, well, ha what do we actually have to do at a minimum to produce that additional value above and beyond, you know, just carrying AP Associated Press, Canadian press reports, but really doing if you value investigative work, investigative work, and then what is it that make, would make it possible for us to continue to stay in business doing that fundamental thing? And I'm present, presenting that as if that's an easy problem to solve, and of course it isn't, but at least you're moving back to you know, solving a more fundamental problem that may give you a wider range of options. And this comes back to, to something we mentioned earlier, which is Wicked problems are rarely the first thing that you see. It's not the obvious solution that's likely to, to, to bring you any kind of relief. The trouble is, when you take that step back, you're generally increasing the scope uh, of the change that you're going to need to make. If you are the CEO, then you can maybe do that. If you're four levels down from the CEO, maybe you still have 10,000 people who report to you, you may not have the scope or the power to be able to make a, a structural change to the way that your organization functions. So it's a real challenge. Like there's, there, there are issues of how much effect you can have personally in your domain. What you have to look at is maybe your, what's your scope of action? How big of a problem are you personally in a position to tackle? What can you change and what can you not? In the book, Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, a great example of that is the author, Rich Drumel. He talks about a case where somebody he knows was looking at the issue of education in schools. And he said, well, fundamentally, his friend recommended some changes to the way that schools are run. He knows, and his friend knows, that a lot of what drives performance of kids in school is outside of the control of the school, right? It has to do with what's going on in the community and the conditions under which they're being raised and, you know, issues around poverty and racism and a whole host of things that the school can't do a thing about. What he had to do was go back and say, well, if I'm working in the domain of the school... What can I change that might have an effect on this problem and move things in the direction I want? There are two challenges there. One is that the root cause kind of problem that you're trying to solve 
may be impossible for you to ever deal with yourself, at least in any sort of a short-term way. Another is that if you go into trying to deal with that kind of an issue, presuming that you're going to fail, you're not going to be very motivated and it's going to be very difficult for you to motivate others to, to actually take any kind of coherent action. As a saying, an individual reporter is not going to be able to change the infrastructure associated with news distribution, advertising revenue, and, and all of those things. Is there something that you can do at, at any level? Are there any key factors that anyone can always do with a wicked problem? I'm asking your opinion here. I think not. I think that there are wicked problems that an individual really truly cannot solve. And I, I would have to agree with that. There may not be anything that you can do in your scope of action. There might. Uh, there have been a few people who've managed to start building up a base as an independent journalist. And through advertising on podcasts and their website and going for things like donations uh, through organizations like Patreon have been able to operate at that level. But that's probably only going to be workable for a limited number of people, both in terms of the number of people who are willing to pay for that and in terms of developing the skill set that gets you that funding, which may not have anything much to do with the skill set that makes you a great investigative reporter. If I'm an author and my, my revenue stream is based on the number of books that I produce, going out to a conference to... Uh, to talk to fans, I might really enjoy that. But self-promotion is not where I'm making my money, or at least I wasn't. Now, do I have to become a marketing manager to be able to sell on my book? Because if that's the case, then I'm not writing books. So what do I have to sell? That's why traditional publishing is still popular with many authors and why a lot of big authors still prefer to go that route. Yes, you could make a ton of money self-publishing, but they don't want to be spending all of their time marketing and selling their books. They want somebody else to take care of that so that they can focus on the writing. You want sous chefs. You want to be the chef. Right. And that may be possible for some people, but there's going to be a lot of people who are not in a position to, to strike out on their own or have no desire, or don't have the right skills, and won't have the right skills. Like, they're not inclined to, to do that kind of thing. Which I could give a great simple answer, but it turns out that if you think about something for a little while, and you cannot find a simple answer, you may be dealing with a wicked problem. Exactly. The fact that this gets more complicated the more you think about it is another of those signals that you're dealing with a wicked problem. Until not that long ago, most systems were relatively simple. I mean that business practices were not as uh, deeply integrated as they are now. So today, if you look at any given business practice, it is tied to thousands and thousands and thousands of other factors over which you have no control and which could destroy you or elevate you at any moment. If Facebook changes the way they do uh, a tiny thing about their algorithm, then your entire business can go away. To put it another way, if your energy company decided to go from, you know, 60 hertz to 90 hertz, your whole house, your whole business, everything, it all stops. This is where wicked problems are particularly painful. You know, you mentioned that earlier on that you and I both come out of an environment where we've worked extensively on business analysis. And one of the things that I found doing business analysis is that most business problems start out looking really complicated and really confusing. And then you start to be able to identify what is and isn't important. And you whittle it down to, you know, a set of root causes and set of actions and ultimately a model of the reality that really helps clarify what you should do and what is going to be effective and what is going to be right. Wicked problems are almost the opposite of that. They can start out looking simple and then they get hairier and hairier and hairier and they never stop getting hairier. There is no simple model that you can get to in a wicked problem to make it not wicked. 
So this means that if you want to take action, and, and you must, you have to use some other factor to set a boundary around the problem. The simplest factor, I think, to, to, to use is your corporate culture. I mean, ideally, that is represented in your corporate strategy. If you can look to what the company believes in as if it was a, an entity, a conscious entity, then you can find a set of limitations that constrain what you can do, at least at first blush. Now, the challenge there is, if what you believe in is fighting against player pianos, then maybe you need to find a new industry. I think that, that that combined with what you're able to do and the scope of which you can act give you a space in which you can act against the wicked problem. Now, as I said, it may be that that space is not one which is going to let you survive and you're going to die or you're going to change radically. But if it is one in which you can survive, then the next step is to try to gain more information about what will and will not work. Avoid committing everything on one shot if you can. Run smaller experiments that will give you a better sense of what could work. What do you mean by an experiment in this case? You know, should I break out the beakers? Uh, no. Let, so let's go back to the news thing. Um, so let's say you had a, you were trying to figure out, well, what's the model that's going to work? Well, one thing you might do if you were a big news company is spin off a little sub-organization. If you go to, say, Toronto newspapers a few years back, maybe let's do a dedicated Does Rob Ford Smoke Crack site and try some of these models like patronage and so on and see, and see what happens. See if it works, if it doesn't work, if there's a backlash, but you fence it off from the main organization so that you're in a position later on to say, it eh, didn't work, kill it. That you're not betting the star as a whole on this. Maybe you're just following one story from beginning to end and seeing if it generates something that could be the nucleus of a viable model and that you learn what would or would not work. Or you might find that pieces of it make sense, even if the whole doesn't. So you're creating the capacity to pivot. I'm taking it from more of a startup perspective, just to try and get you to a future that might be viable. One of the characteristics of startups is that they tend to be radically different from the things that exist and that are delivering some kind of a service today. If you're going to try that kind of an experiment, you don't want to do something incremental. Take a significant step away from the current model. Give yourself a, a control group, basically, and, and try to disentangle some of the key factors to see what works, as you say, and, and what doesn't. If you're just going to increment a little bit, if you're just going to change the number of ads on, on the Rob Ford page, then you're doing A-B testing. It may help you perform a holding action, but it's not going to solve anything, really. No, an A-B test is just going to tell you the right amount of ads, but the ad model has to fundamentally be working in order for tweaking the number of ads to optimize the revenue that you generate from something. Well, I'm glad this is called the Change Fail Podcast because I'm not feeling optimistic. No, this was definitely not change success. I mean, we've talked about some things that you can do, but if you're faced with a wicked problem, failure is... Failure's always an option. <laughs> yes, I was trying not to say that, but yes. But with some wicked problems, failure may not be an option, and that, that's where it gets nasty, right? So let's be clear. Failure's always an option. It's not the one that you want, and it's not the one that you're aiming for. But the reality is that uh, it's entirely possible to do everything right and also to fail. Especially here, yes. Yeah, so that's something that I think you need to recognize going in, that uh, when you have a wicked problem to deal with, you should take those steps to prepare for failure and perhaps to fail safe if you can. So... In the newspaper industry, when we look at what we do today, we have like three or four separate business models that have been integrated into this one big thing due to historical twists of fate and technological development. So maybe we let three of those four fail. 
try to sell them off, try to repurpose them, whatever. And we continue with only one of them. Like the actual news generation piece, the investigative reporting, as opposed to, you know, distributing pieces of paper or printing on paper or, you know, selling ads. If you prepare for that kind of failure, maybe you can get away with only losing half of your business instead of losing all of it. And you, ha- you look at what store, what is it that you can uniquely do that will provide value? For instance, you know, to go to something that newspapers often do, things like covering city council reports. Although we have come to no positive resolution here, I think we might be done. This was thought provoking. Not as much fun as talking about Cap and, you know, the Marvel Universe. And hopefully, even if it doesn't give you a way out, at least it gives you a way in to understanding what situation you really are trying to deal with. This has been the Change Fail Podcast with Kevin Brennan and Julian Sammy. You can subscribe, uh, listen, watch, and read at change.fail. It's not change.fail.com. It's just change.fail. You can also find out more about Kevin and me and what we do and how we do it. And you can even contact us to find out if we can do it to you. I was thinking four, probably two, but all right. Game time decision.